Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Great, welcome to uh, the brain hack on the diffusion imaging. Um, so usually we don't do brain hack in fancy hotels like this, but we're very excited to have this fantastic venue. Uh, we've been uh, supported financially by the Federal Science Center. So I thank you very much for the Federal Science Center. How many of you uh, did a brain hack before? Just raise your hand. This is not the majority, so we'll choose through how it works. Um, first, we have like uh, fantastic speakers uh, that will help you, that will give that presentation during the brain hack, but also help you through the brain hack for you to acquire skills, knowledge, or achieve your project. Uh, we have uh, Alessandro Danucci, who's right here. Great expert in brain microstructure, as as with diffusion imaging. Uh, we have uh, Stephanie Focal. She's a great anatomy expert, expert in trichography with a special interest in language, which is my weakness. So if you have language questions, she's the right. Um, we have Chris Coulon, who is a computational uh, informatic expert in programming and also who developed like all the software that we developed in the lab so far. Valentina Pacella, who is working on cognition and the relationship between the brain connections and cognition and disconnections. Um, she's in the back right there. And Marco Palombo, who is also an expert in microstructure, which is a, 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 a theme that we don't. Uh, explore so much in my lab so that was great that we have this uh, partnership for teaching you about diffusion image so this is a program of the three days um i'll give you an introduction to the white matter and tractography and some uh, presentation of the recent advanced tractography tools that we developed and how you can integrate it into your framework of research um and, uh, then you'll have a coffee break. Coffee break is happening downstairs, ground floor at the bar. Um, then after that, there will be the project pitch. I know some of you were confused about what is this. Uh, it's mostly because there is a lot of hands-on work in the afternoon. So when you have a project that you want to achieve, or like your, your personal PhD project, but you feel you don't have the skills or you want to work with other people to learn a little bit uh, how to explore your question differently, you can pitch it during the brain hack, saying like, I will be working on this data set of uh, stroke uh, patients, I have diffusion imaging, and I try to extract connectivity metrics, which actually is one of the projects that you're working. Um, and uh, then during the three days, people will come to you either to learn from you or to help you out to achieve your project with uh, different tools or different ways. We've been doing this for years. It's quite exciting because this is a temporary, temporary lab for three days uh, where like people interact a lot. Um, we actually get quite a lot done. Another advantage is uh, I'm the editor in chief of brain structure and function, and we have a collection in brain structure and function dedicated to any scientific output that comes from a brain hack that we call brain hack advances. Uh, brain structure and function is free for submission and free for publication. So you just write your paper, you submit it, and provided a review as a happy user, which is always a struggle, uh, then we'd be happy to publish it. <clears throat> then you have like a lunch break 
just one hour, please stay on time. And then we start in the afternoon working on the project that being pitched in the morning. And so we do little groups in different tables and you can extend if you want onto the couch that's found uh, uh, outside of the couch downstairs. I'll give you a list of uh, softwares. It's uh, not like obligatory in any way. It's just it's practical. If you want to analyze your data, or if you want to learn some things, if you already have the software installed on your computer, rather than having to download it on the internet and install it, so we gain some time. And so, like the first day, we're going to talk mostly about the macro structure of the connection of the brain. This is what you can see with the naked eye if you were opening and dissecting the brain. Those are like big structure of thousands and thousands of bundles and how they connect different things at the world brain level. On the second day, uh, we have uh, Marco and Alessandro are going to tackle the microstructure. The microstructure, as the name indicates, what you cannot see with the naked eye, you will need a microscope which we don't necessarily have with MRI, but we can assess looking at the behavior of water molecule in terms of micron, how much they move, diffuse, and extract from this very interesting information about uh, uh, the structure that is around the car, the kind of neuron, the axonal uh, diameter, eventually uh, the dendrit uh, density, uh, we'll, we'll see that more. Uh, then after the coffee break, we'll have free salon. We'll, we'll talk to you of the uh, long range impact of brain disconnection. So if you have like a lesion in the brain, it's not going to only damage where the lesion is. It will have an impact on the microorganization around the brain that will reveal some differences on the measurement that we can have of the brain, which is see cortical sickness, fractional anisotropy, functional connectivity, Entropy, MRI, thing. Then right after that, we do a project update. And we, we added that in the latest year because uh, it's important. If you feel like your group is not, not going to manage to solve the riddle of the project pitch you did on the first day, during the project update, you can call for help and be like, well, we're stuck with this kind of analysis and we don't know how to do it. And people like would gather and help you out to achieve what you want to achieve uh, uh, by providing the know-how, strategy, or ideas. Then again, we have a lunch, which will be one hour later than the first day. Um, and then we work on the hands-on, again, trying to achieve those projects. Then we have the social evening. So most favorite time, usually during the brain hack, it's at uh, 6 30. We'll be at the bar, the Frescalini. The first drink is offered if you arrive on time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I can uh, um, and then the last day, uh, we do some dissection with uh, Stephanie Fockel and myself. Well, I'll show you how to uh, use the software and extract main white matter connections, teaching you a little bit about neuroanatomy and white matter neuroanatomy. Um, Stephanie will give you a special focus on the language connections, and then I'll do the frontal parietal attention connection, uh, all that in about two, three hours. We'll give uh, some uh, uh, concluding remarks, which include like uh, all the achievements that people have been doing so far. <clears throat> we'll have uh, another uh, lecture in the afternoon by Valentina Bazar that will show that how the, you have a specific pattern of disconnection in the brain can make a match. Very interesting neuropsychological disorders. Then we can carry on with hands-on, and we'll have this extra talk uh, that we will stream online. Uh, a step. What was it again? It's on Wednesday, 4 p.m. It's a PMS conference. We are on the effect of cognitive disease on speech. And then, uh, then after that, you'll have Thursday and Friday to recover from this very intensive three days of, of work. Any questions regarding the, the organization? You good? Don't be shy. It's very interactive. You can really, you know.
That's an issue. Don't be shy. Now, so I'll go quickly through the title of the different project dish because it's um, it's good to always give like a snapshot so you can think about it. Then you'll have the coffee break. You can approach different people based on those titles. And then they will give like a five minute speech about what they what they actually want to do. So so far, if I didn't forget anybody, and if I forgot somebody, do not hesitate to tell me. Uh, we have a Federica Santa Cross, who's right here in the back. Who's right here? Like that's you. Like uh, so that people can identify you. <laughs> She would like to work on fiber track shaped cortical morphology, so how fibers can impact the uh, morphology of the brain. Um, then we have uh, Mohamed Adi Harabi, right there, would like to work on multiple sclerosis disconnection symptom mapping. I give you a type title, but mm -hmm. that's pretty much what you want to do. Um, I started taking some notes <laughs> until you can solve it over here, so don't look at that. Uh, we have Valentina Pasella would like to crack the color to integration and simulate disconnection via machine learning. She is over there with a yellow sweater. And uh, she's really motivated. She sent two projects. And the other one is normalizing the abnormal density, normalize image lesion can be registered onto a standard MNA2 template. We we'll say yes if you have the right template, uh, but we're good. Figures like that. <clears throat> then we have Marta Gaviragi. Sorry. Gaviragi. Okay. Gaviragi. Sorry. <laughs> Sweep of tractography. How can we clean unrealistic anatomical tracks? Big questions. We'll try to figure out a solution. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Ivan Midlin, who we met this morning. Um, <laughs> We would like to work on from DTI to World Brain Model building individual connectivity matrices of DOS. These are the consciousness patients. Uh, I did a couple of slides on consciousness just of you. Yeah, I did my stuff this morning according to the project. Thomas Orsay was right here, uh, who came to process his baboon data set from raw bits format to TBSS and uh, mean tractography. Um, then we have Eleonora Ele Grande, who is not here, okay. Not enough. is that the exam is spelled? No, okay. Well, she will work on structural brain connectivity and neuropsychological deficits investigation in glioma patients. Lily Dorian. Hi, Lily. She will uh, work on spontaneous interhemispheric resynchronization of the human brain. Very exciting. Looking forward to hear your project picture for this. And then Stephanie Falkel in a range of the bed, uh, who's going to do as a language function income. If you don't know what the function income is, don't worry. Let me talk about that in a minute. All good. Do I have all the project pitch? You good? No second thought until I got. Oh, I wish I had the project. You good? You still have time. Just tell me during the coffee break and we can add you in. All right. Let's do an introduction about uh, white matter and tractography. Um, well, we, you know, we essentially as good as how we want to look or how we imagine the brain works. Um, you have different dimensions into the way you look at the brain. You can look at the brain from the surface and describe the brain based on circumvolution, gyri, cell size, and describe the localization of lesion, the localization of activation in those different areas based on the shape of the surface of the brain. And many, even though that sounds a little superficial, this is the main cause, the analysis of people that are doing surface analysis, just interested about the surface. 
you can slice your brain. Whether you do it in real or you do it with MRI, when you start slicing the brain, you realize that there is not only a surface, there is also white matter and some cortical structures that you can uh, identify, uh, such as uh, the striatum or the thalamus. Those subcortical structures have a big importance in them of uh, the functioning of the brain. We know that because when you knock it out with a stroke, you usually have very strong disorder. And then most recently, and just well, most recently, because I'm not as young as I used to, but in the last 20 years, getting closer to 30, uh, we developed like uh, methods to study the white matter connection in the living human brain, which allow you to now measure how things are connected together rather than looking at how, where, how thing, where things are happening. That's essentially what you can do by looking at the wires. And um, this is not the first time we speak about the white matter. Uh, you know, we knew since the 16th century that white matter does exist. At that time, the section went like digital and quite gross, you were like slicing directly the skull of people and describing what was going, and they were carrying on through the entire body. So there's people pointing with their finger and saying, look, there's a brain and you have different different kind of matter. You have a grayish one on the surface and a whitish one on the side. And they had no idea really the white, what the whitish one was bad because white matter post-mortem is the tissue that degrades the fastest. But you don't study it very quickly or if you don't have a preparation, all you're going to see is a whitish much of stuff you won't see an organization. Um, but Nicola Steno in the 17th century was able to prepare his cadaver and look at the brain and see a little bit of this white matter organization and realize that rather than having a mush, really, you had fibers that were like organized in a very helpful manner. Seems to be very ordered uh, group of cables connecting things without really knowing what it was good. But that still motivated anatomy that started making the first drawing of the white matter organization. And here you have like the first depiction of the projection system uh, going from the spinal cord to the surface and from the cerebellum uh, to our uh, 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 subcortical nuclei. And that's, that's from Raymond Busen in the 18th century. But you see like the evolution of science in 300 years here about the white matter. But essentially describing something and its anatomy and showing how beautifully it is does not really explain how it works. You need really like insights uh, into how, how things are working in order to fuel really the way people are going to explore it and put more effort on describing it. It's funny enough because the way why matter is working is not coming from a neuroanatomy. It's not even somebody working in neuroscience. It's coming from Isaac Newton, who suggested to us that actually those white matter bundles, connections in the brain, were working through electrical information communicated from the brain to the muscles or from one brain structure to another. If you're interested, he actually describes this at the end of this book, uh, Mathematica Principia. Um, in the last chapter, when he finished to explain everything about, you know, the Newton laws, that like, here's a chapter about all the field of research that I don't know about, but I'm interested and I would like to give you some insights. One of the true genes, which is like, and so in that chapter, there is this part about the brain and the connections. Means that you have this electrical influx going from region to region, or from the brain to the muscle. That did indeed motivate people a lot into describing better uh, the connection in the brain. But again, you gotta get access to postmodern brain and do those very painstaking and difficult dissections. You're gonna like go back if you destroy your sample accidentally by doing the wrong cut. It's just, boom, you get to find another human 
brain. Somebody die, you can you can extract the brain, prepare it into another dissection. So you have here the first description of the arcuate fasciculus, which, funny enough, was described in the right hemisphere. It's supposed to be a very important track for language. So I should have been describing the left hemisphere, it's not the case. Um, and here you have a description of the inferior original fasciculus. And then you have, uh, so that was Johan Christian Real. I'm sorry, that guy don't speak to me. Uh, and then you have Carl Friedrich Buda, who describes those uh, projection uh, pathways over here, as well as uh, describe on axonal section the location of the signal and the inferior legitimate. We owe the Germans the naming of those white matter connections. The naming of white matter connection is based on the shape of the track. So you have an arcuate or an arc like a bow, and that's why it bears this name. Uncinate fasciculus for a hook. That's where it, the name comes from. Single, like a belt. So also where the came, name uh, uh, come from. So size is a shape, or it's the orientation. You have inferior longitudinal. It's longitudinal, so it's going straight. It's inferior in the brain. Or eventually, some tracks bear the name based on the projection. So you have inferior frontal occipital fasciculus because it's inferior and then it's a frontal lobe, which is the occipital lobe. And that's it. Don't have to divide more or two branches or give new names. Those are like the rules that they set up that are actually quite simple. They describe based on the shape, describe based on the trajectory or described based on the projections. Okay. Then we had like a, a big leap into like the white matter knowledge and anatomy with the work of Theodor Mind, who uh, has been the first who gave a clear classification of white matter connections that will help to understand a little bit more about their role with the functioning of the brain. So first, it describes uh, connections. So we're going from the center of the brain on the spinal cord and going on to the surface of the brain. Do you know what name we gave to those connections? Illustration. So very practical and logic. I do that so that because if you Think about it, then you remember. No suggestion? No helping in the back, okay? Those are the projection fibers. Just because they project, you can imagine projecting from the center to the periphery, from the spinal cord to the cortex, from the cerebellum to the cortex and the cortical nuclei. Then, once he was done with the projection fibers, it was like, oh, well, we want to see the category of fibers. Also interesting that connect the left hemisphere with the right hemisphere. And the right hemisphere with the left hemisphere. The two hemisphere together. Do you know which name he gave to that? The suggestions. Double skeleton is one of them. We have entered to be sure you have. Interthalamic uh, connection through commercial fibers, like a link between those two. Those are very important. You know, if you think about it, you got two eyes, two visual fields, the project respectively into uh, the left and the right of the below. Yet, you have this panoramic vision. There is no split. And that's because of the work of those commercial fibers. With this, you can also see in 3D, thanks to the different perspective and the way information is integrated between the hemisphere. That's how important are those connections. <clears throat> then we found like another category of fibers that was very strange. Those fibers 
We're connecting regions within the same hemisphere. Right into the frontal lobe with the parietal lobe, or the frontal lobe with the occipital lobe. And that is strange because those are very long connections. Connecting an organ with itself it is very expensive, phylogenetically speaking. And what is this for? Why wouldn't you put those two regions next to each other if they were to be connected together? It's like a very strange. Very strange idea, but you give like some idea of the mechanism that would support that. I like I like this. Uh, what they call association fibers, and uh, I like this illustration. I think it makes a. Uh, this like, no, entirely correct, but it gives you an idea of what an association fiber is. So you take a little chip that does represent like an individual with very low. Very small knowledge of the environment and the nature around us, ready to learn. And you take this candle with a flame, and the kids are always attracted to shiny stuff. So, what the kid's gonna do when he sees a flame, he's gonna try to grab it with his hand. In order to see the flame, you need to have the visual input goes to the eye and we get to the occipital lobe. And then give you the coordinates to your arm in order to reach that flame. <laughs> you reach that flame, you touch that flame, but you burn yourself. And then you have these ascending fibers that will go through uh, the brain, thalamus, projected sensory cortex, eye that burns. Won't do that again. Why will you not do that again? That's because there is a connection between the sensory, visual, and motor center, a representation that is made by the association between those different bonds that, that create a memory that is according to this model and great in the way things are connected together. Okay? You're not going to create new neurons to make this knowledge happen, just trying to change the way they're connected. So you make the association, next time you see the candle on the flame with a pain and touching it, and you're just like, not gonna do that. Okay, that's a, that's a theory of mind. And then you can interpret it in two different ways that I will describe to you. Is that like a serial event that happened in the brain, A is speaking to B, speaking to C, speaking to D, or is it an integrative mechanism where the knowledge emerge from the way things are inter interconnected together. I'll get back to that later. So look at our connection also revise a little bit the way we interpret the functioning of the brain because we used to look at the anatomy with like, oh, this is an anterior, posterior, left lateral, inferior lesion, activation, whatever you want to say. Then we've been slicing it since Palerac and give it coordinates in the stereotactic space. There'll be coordinates minus 26 plus 10, 24 is the voxel that is holding consciousness. And like with connections, technically, voxel or place doesn't really have a matter because those are highway. They're like connecting things between 300 and 500 kilometers per hour. You take a bullet train. It's like you're in this axon sending information from one city to another. So like the compressed space in the brain um, provide the communication of information uh, between brain regions real fast. So you're really gonna be more interested in that like more an association that is happening or an exchange between the hemisphere or like the projection of subcortical information onto the cortex uh, that is related to my functional mind disorder. So all that was logic and interpretation and theories that emerged from people doing Postmodern dissections from the 16th 
to the end of the 20th century. Just because we can look at it in the living human brain, we couldn't really study it. The way we can now do with deficient weighted imaging tractography. So different way that imaging has been invented by uh, Peter Basser, Matillo, and Denis, Denis Le Bihan. Um, So they created this sequence that is looking at uh, the diffusion of water in the brain. And the first trial was with a piece of steak in the MRI scan that they scanned uh, with a diffusion sequence and look and model with this mathematical approach, which is called the tensor, the orientation of the diffusion of water molecule inside that steak uh, that happened to go this way, build a steak with an of fibers, muscle fibers, and constrain the diffusion of water molecule in the main direction of the fibers. And then I don't know how it happened, but maybe the need or Peter get in the MRI scan and go turn that stick. Peter is going to turn slightly the stick, to reduce the acquisition, to reduce the tensor model, and voila, the orientation of the diffusion of water molecule turn with the rotation of the fibers of the stick, demonstrating that you can infer the microstructural organization of the fibers in the stake with diffusion imaging. It was just a demonstration, no interest with the stake. The idea was we can now apply that to other parts of the body, the brain being a big, a big center of interest. So the brain, as we say, it is, uh, simply speaking, made of two categories of tissues. You're gonna have the gray matter, you're gonna have the white matter. Usually when you do MRI scan, you don't see this kind of resolution, this is just uh, metaphor, imagine it takes this voxel inside the gray matter. You'll see neurons, astrocytes, uh, maybe eventually in microglia, and water molecules gonna diffuse in between the structure in a bit of way aleatory. So see, like they constrained by the structure, but they're gonna diffuse, they get some space diffuse in between. In a brand, okay. And again, we we use the same mathematical models that I explained to you before. We apply a tensor into like the gray matter. We obtain a sphere because there is no preferential direction in the diffusion of water molecule inside that tissue. Okay. We take a, another voxel, same size, but we do it in the white matter. Uh, you can see axons organized in a parallel way, constraining the diffusion of water molecule in a given direction. And then water molecules that are constrained diffuse inside the axon, eventually between the axons when they are spaced in the direction of the axons. You measure that with different weighted imaging, sum it up the tensor model, then a sheet cigar that is elongated according to the main direction of the diffusion of water inside that tissue. Then the idea is simple. So, so, so you can define rules. But you connect the different voxels in the brain according to the concordance of the trajectory that is going from millimeter to millimeter in the brain. And then from local estimate of the direction of the addition of water molecule, you obtain trajectories in two dimensions that in three dimensions makes bundle like this. And then when you do it at the entire brain level, you obtain what we call uh, the connectome, which is what we say the micro connectome, which is like the main white matter structure of a living human brain. Each of those streamline or tube are not individual axons, they represent like thousands of axons that are going in the same direction. And you can already identify some structures. 
you see the spinal cord, you see if you do pessinus, the corpus skeleton in the <laughs> hemisphere, uh, you see the cerebellum where you start to project onto the cortex, and you see laterally, and the compress is not really good with this video projector, but you'll see the arcade fasciculus on the left and on the right hemisphere. This arcade fasciculus match the postmodern dissection that have been done in the uh, 19th century with a species by uh, Christian Rell, or is that told by Joseph Tejerin, it's actually his wife, it's a drawing, she can bring it, she did the entire book. Uh, not as good in drawing, frankly, but still, you know, very accurate. And here he has a depiction in a single subject in 2002 of the arcade fasciculus, except that that person is still living. And that's huge breakthrough being able to see the information in living people. That means you can go back and dissect more, you have the entire brain, you can correlate it with behavior, you can study neuroanatomy, you can uh, project different features on it. We'll go through that. Being able to uh, study uh, those connections in a group of participants also allowed to uh, depict the anatomy in a way that we couldn't before such as uh, going further up for the arcade fasciculus anatomy and see that beyond connections between the Broca territory, which is important for speaking, and the Wernicke territory, which is important for understanding. You probably all seen in your books at university, this connection between the two, for the arcade fasciculus, important for language. You do have adjacent connections so I called at that time posterior segment and anterior segment that follow the same trajectory but make it stop in the parietal lobe. In the parietal lobe, you will see Stephanie Focco is very important for language. It makes totally sense to have a stop here with those connections. Okay, and then by studying anatomy and the connection, you see how you can like start linking things together and understand. By looking at the circuitry, we we'll start understanding by looking at circuitry how things are really working together. And we do a little anatomy break so that you guys can learn a little bit about the different tracks. Those are main connections that I accepted in 2008 with a simple model of diffusion imaging tractography based on the tensor. Um, but yeah, it's always good to, uh, to learn a little bit. Who can give me the name of the connection on the top left, red? This shy. That's right, that's the copy scanners. Then the, the one right next to it, they look like a mustache. Yeah, we said that. Very commission. Good job. Very commission. Then like this one, I spoke about it, kind of looks like a hook. Go fishing. Oh, it's an uh, ancinite fascicle, it's very good. Now oh, this one is very long, connect the occipital lobe to the frontal lobe, the inferior part of the brain. So when it's a little shorter, inferior part of the brain connects the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe, straight. Inferior longitudinal fasciculus. It's a straight connection. This one is the arcade. Then this one, and you see it from the top, it makes a belt around the tropiscalus. Same villain, very good. This one is the core structure of the limbic system. Yeah, starting from amida body, arching around the thalamus, spooning the hippocampus. Then you have uh, um, pyramid, like it bear, like different connections are going through how you look at it. But those are the projection system. You have the pyramidal track, cortical spinal track. Um, and then you have all these bunch of connections in the cerebellum, but I won't 
challenge you on this. All right, let's do it again. From left out of you, that the way you feel the 3 d construction in your brain of those connections. What is it? Yeah, this one. Excellent. This one. This one. Yeah. This one. Yeah. The imperial job fasciculus. Can I use a nickname then? Archer fasciculus. Singulum. Well, next. Yeah, yeah, pyramidal track, cortical spinal get a different name, coronal radiator. And then you have all these. Uh, so you have like the spinal cerebellar, superior cerebellar, cortical pontal cerebellar, um, the base on the names where they're coming from, what, what they're connecting. All right, that's good. And that's that was tractography in 2008. Um, I was good in the way that allowed us to look at things that we couldn't look at before, but it's far from being perfect because one axon is one to five micron. One voxel at that time was two millimeters. Then all axons are not always going in the same direction. And they're not always of the same population. And you can imagine the kind of limitations that that can produce. I'll give you an example. So we spoke about the corpus callus, and I showed you a corpus callus that does project medially onto the middle surface of the brain. Um, and I remember um, as a student being at the American Academy of Neurology, and there was this Texan researcher saying that he discovered that the corpus callus, despite what we saw, only project on middle structure in the brain. Because of tractography. The prime is like, you know, tractography is probably very good, but more or less good to describe it. I already know. It's probably not yet ready to discover a new track on itself. You need to validate it with other things. In the case of uh, the corpus callosum, with standard model, you have medial projection, but what you know from post-modern dissection, what you can see here is the corpus callosum is crossing the corona radiata, which is spinal, pyramidal track, the one that is going vertically, to project on the lateral surface of the brain. And we just don't see that. We also know like uh, in monkeys, uh, you inject the entire surface on the left hemisphere, and you look at your project, on the right hemisphere, you project you project in the left hemisphere, you do see that you have those very strong projection from one hemisphere to the other on almost the entire surface of the brain. But why would human have something different? So some people will say it's because humans are unique. Others say it's just because the neighbor has limitations. And we're not very good at crossing this pyramidal track that stop fibers reaching the lateral surface of the brain. Then, like you have, um, and it's still a hot debate. You have people who are like, it's okay. I'm just going to lower the restriction that I put on my tractography to see more of what I want to see and show you the lateral projection. This is a typical approach of playing with probabilistic tractography, which can technically connect everything with everything that play of probabilities. And so according to the threshold you put in the probability as you want to see, you'll start seeing lateral projection of the corpus callus. But this is at the expense of also seeing connections that do not exist. And then you have the entire field of people doing research onto like, but if we remove what we know that is not correct and just keep what we know that is correct, then we have a better tractography. As at this point, you can just carve what you want to see without using tractography um, 
Um, then, then you you will have what you need. So I spoke about the corpus callosum, but you'll say, well, I work in clinic. Nobody cares about the corpus callosum. Uh, uh, speak about the corticospinal tract. That's an important tract for the direct connection between the brain and the muscle. Um, if you cut it, you you paralyze or emi paralyzed. This is the beautiful depiction of the corticospinal tract by Riley Macker and Al in 2001. Slice by slice, they've been looking at post mortem uh, uh, reconstruction that they, that they marked in pen subject and created this average cortical spinal tract in the Royal Neurological Institute in the stereotype space. Mm -hmm. And in 2011, when I did my atlas and I compared them like side by side, this is what we had with tractography. Um, cortical spinal tract is uh, only connecting the leg. Good luck with the rest of the body. Apparently, it's not connected. We call it tractography. And that was a huge problem because if people use it clinically, it can have an impact. Uh, Sam Logic, you can think that you can extract this information by loosening a little bit the rules of how you connect things together. An example is probably the tractography. You lower your threshold and start obtaining like lateral projection, but that's at the expanse of connections that do not exist, are going on the other hemisphere, it's going everywhere in the brain. And of course, you can hide that. But if you hide what you don't want to see, how can you be sure of what you seek? It's, it's a huge fundamental question that I think is critical in tractography. And it has an impact. It has an impact in this kind of case. Uh, those very courageous neurosurgeon who published this, uh, this paper where they use tractography to inform the surgery in kids that they uh, that had a um, localized glioma in their brain. Um, and they wanted to uh, remove uh, this glioma without interrupting the corticospinal tract. And in order to avoid Interrupting the cortical spinal tracks, they use tractograph in those kids to map the voxels that had. And unfortunately, you know, because tractography doesn't see the lateral projection, they've been cutting some of the cortical spinal tracks, those kids come out with ME paralysis. Oh, this, is, this is no joke. What we're telling the neurosurgeon, they might take it, run themselves, and do real damage. You need to be careful. With the anatomy for of the brain. And this is making progress. Like, uh, so I've been working a lot with Fabio de Montfort. That's the uh, thing you can see that for example, the um, corpus callosum. Now we have new models that are like uh, modeling the crossing of the multiple population of fibers in the brain and can reveal now a corpus callosum that is crossing through. Uh, the uh, cortical spinal coronary that has a way that is valid and um, look like what we would expect distracted. Main issue still being the resolution of the different way in measuring that we have that is no match to the axons that we try to measure and the population of axons that we try to measure. But we should not give up. This is the only way we can look at white matter. Um, uh, so you have here like a reconstruction of the cortical spinal tract. Uh, that I get, I think it's my brain. You see, like the very close size of the local estimate of the uh, 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 direction of the water diffusion. And then instead of having like a cigar, you have like some stuff that will need to uh, follow uh, the white matter structures. With that, you can revise a little bit. The anatomical nomenclature and the mapping of the one matter tracks. You can see here, for example, uh, a more advanced depiction of the white matter. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to have to go through this again. Uh, the top left over there, you have three branches that are straight connecting uh, the frontal lobe to the parietal lobe, superior part of the brain. That's why they are called superior longinal fasciculus divided in three branches thanks to uh, the axonal tracing 
works have been done by Fitcher in 1981. On the right, number four and number five, you have together a main connection of the limbic system, the cingulum arching around, the corpus callosum, and the ancinate fasciculus, these little hooks that will connect the orbital cortex with the amygdala down to the temporal pole. It's an interesting connection, like psychopath, a very tiny one. And uh, Phineas Gage will see the chart, knock it out with the passage of the barrel inside his brain. Here, number six and number seven, you will have six, your arcuate fasciculus. Number seven, you have the frontal connection that are adjacent to the arcuate fasciculus that technically should be part of the superimaginal fasciculus, but out of respect for the researchers that described those three segments and to be accordant with the literature, we still keep it a little bit separated. Um, number eight, connecting the frontal lobe to the occipital lobe, huge direct connection, failure frontal occipital fasciculus. Number nine, you see your corpus callosum here, it's just the frontal part that I displayed here, because it was special background of the frontal lobe. You see how we project laterally on almost the entire surface of the frontal lobe. Number 10, special interest onto the corticospinal tract, fanning onto the motor moncus. Number 12 and number 11 are projection from the striatum, which we must stop putting marks on this, uh, on the striatum and the thalamus. You see how they are like mixed, embedded together, very hard to disentangle. Number 13, those are projection of the pons. I do believe there is like way more projection of the pons. You just can't see it because of this huge big vessels that we have when we do diffusion, but it's still interesting to look at that. You have a probably what is the core of the track where like most of the axons are packed together coming from the pons. Then we started describing what we call frontal U shaped uh, connections or tracks. Those are like small. Fibers connecting adjacent gyri. Um, for example, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 are U shaped connection connecting the motor homunculus with the sensory homunculus following the spatial mapping of uh, those two homunculus. Number 19 is a new track that we described. That was in the axonal tracing in monkeys, but never really described. So we gave it a name, the name that we chose. Uh, and like idiot, we didn't follow the nomenclature of the old people. We gave it a name which sounded really found cool, which was Aslant. We call it the frontal Aslant track because an Aslant is a beam of light that is happening in your attic, crossing through the room the same way that the frontal Aslant is crossing through the frontal lobe. So, Follow the little bit of the shape, but not too poetic. Um, then we should have called it the vertical frontal fasciculus, but that was too broad. Different names. Then you have the two U shaped fibers that are going in the frontal lobe, longitudinal, connecting the posterior part with the anterior part of the frontal lobe, and the superior and the inferior part that. We call frontal inferior longitudinal, longitudinal and frontal superior longitudinal fascicular. Then you have uh, the frontal pole, the frontal orbital polar tract that connects the posterior part of the orbital frontal cortex, which is for very activated when you give reward or took reward to people to the frontal pole. And then we have this track here uh, uh, that is uh, the frontal marginal track, which is a small connection at the end of the frontal pole going around the marginal circuits that divide the frontal pole in two, uh, connecting the lateral to the medial portion. And you can go on and on and describe all the U-shaped fibers in the brain and then start splitting them into sub-branches and going further and further. Uh, 
But yeah. at that point, by carrier, with Steph, we decided that we probably should go to uh, like trying to link up with function before going further into describing more specific sub connection in the brain and give nomenclature to people that they will never use because the description is too fine to match any of the behavior and couldn't figure it out. So one approach of linking, uh, um, and private step will tell you more about that, of linking a uh, function with the white matter is looking at how it's different from one healthy individual to another healthy individual. Um, so if you look, for example, at the arcade fasciculus, some people are having a arcade fasciculus that is really big on the left, and barely nothing in the right hemisphere. Some of the people are more balanced between the left and the right hemisphere and have arcade fasciculus on both sides. And that have an impact onto their performance of the California Verbal Learning Test. It was part of this paper of PNS in 2007. Um, but that can also have an impact link. If you were to have a stroke, which I wish you do not, in your left hemisphere, knocking out your heart and fasciculus, would you rather be in the group one or in the group three? Who wants to be in the group one? Raise your hand. Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be in the group three. Yeah, but back up. You can actually uh, eventually recover. Yeah. I think Steph would mention that in the lecture. That's actually what, what she discovered. And it's also the work of Steph here, where you can see that if you do a big meta analysis of 20 years of trichography, uh, some tracks in the brain have been reported correlating with different functions. And some tracks in the brain are very popular. So we get for certain functions, like the cingulum have been correlating a lot with the executive function. You know, like the like, arcuate fasciculus has been correlating, correlating a lot with language. And the ancinate fasciculus has been correlating a lot with memory and language. Those are very coarse functions because it's a meta-analysis. That indicates you two important things is that we have a bias in exploration, so we explore some tracks for specific functions, but you can see that they do correlate also with this function that you did not expect. You know, they correlate with this function that you did not expect. Uh, so probably the function that are supported by those tracks are not exactly the function that we talk about, but some things that contribute to those different functions in the same way. Um, and then some tracks are way more popular than others. Some tracks are like dissected and correlated a lot. Some others are forgotten, which I don't have here, but I strongly encourage you to read the paper from Stephanie Bottle, 2022 and Return Function. You can start using tractography also to uh, to play around with uh, some some mechanisms that happen in the brain. If you look at the lateralization in the brain, that's what the trihedron that we did in 2019. You have main axis of lateralization of the brain, it's four main axis. Uh, one which is about decision making, another one is emotion, another one is perception action, and another one is language. And you have left and right regions of our uh, lateralized function along those four axes. They allow you to have a, a picture of how the brain is functionally lateralized. And then with that, you can use tractography to try to answer this main question, which is uh, when a function lateralized functionally in the brain, is it going to be more connected to the other hemisphere to provide support to the other hemisphere because the other hemisphere doesn't have this function that happens to lateralize in the left? Or is it going to be less connected to the other hemisphere? Because it developed independently a uh, core processing that only happened in that hemisphere. And so, what we've seen and replicated in the left and the right hemisphere is the more a function is lateralized, the less it is connected to the other hemisphere in the corpus callus. So, there's a less connection you're going to have. Um, 
And so you have here the probability of connection, and here you have the degree of functional lateralization. Uh, uh, the less is lateralized, the higher the connection, the more is lateralized, uh, the lower the cavernous connections. Then you have uh, this other sort of study uh, that I really like uh, that have been done on uh, uh, corpus uh, callosum uh, by the Anita Sass. So he used, if I remember well, magneton cephalography um, to look at uh, the speed of conduction between one uh, visual area and its equivalent with the other hemisphere and one uh, sensory area and its equivalent with the other hemisphere. And what he's been able to see is you have a direct correlation between his estimation in terms of microstructure of the axon diameter of the corpus callosum and the speed of synchronization between two visual areas in the left and the right of the screen and two uh, tactile area in the left and the right of the sphere. And those, those were mm -hmm. identified by the different pieces of the brain. So you can see how you can dig into the mechanism, extract anatomical informative uh, values that you can relate to other modalities of study of the brain and understand the mechanism. It is fast because the axon is big. If the axon was not that big, maybe you can start seeing symptoms that you don't see in the healthy people. So then we started developing a framework. Um, because having high resolution diffusion weight in imaging tractography is expensive and time consuming. And you cannot get like those patients inside the MRI scan, all of them, and tell them like the thousands of patients with stroke, gonna go in the MRI scan, spend two hours to have my sequence of diffusion weight in imaging. First, they won't all be able because some of them are not MRI both. Second, they're probably going to move the MRI scan. And so you need a brain of several minutes for that. Stand like the contribution of like many clinicians to help you to collect those data. So we try to take a different way and find an average version of assessing the connectivity in the brain without having to measure the connectivity in the given brain. And to do that, the idea was to uh, take advantage of the best tractography we can do, which at that time was the human connection project that should be placed down. Um, and then project the injury of single patients inside this tractography in thousands of participants or hundreds of participants. And create those key maps that you have here, which is like the probability of disconnection in those patients. And then run statistics on the probability of disconnection of those patients rather than running statistics on the localization of the lesion, which is the standard approach, or used to be the standard approach. If you do that, you change the model of how you look at the brain working. You're not interested anymore into where the lesion is, you're interested into how did you disrupt the communication inside the brain? And this is a completely different theoretical framework of the functioning of the brain, different data, different approach, different interpretations. I'll come back to that. And that one of the main proof of concepts that we did is applying this to three famous cases um, that are a big pillar into the localization of brain functions. Uh, the first one is Pineas Gage. Anybody doesn't know that the story of Phineas Gage from this guy? You don't know the story of Phineas Gage? Let me go for 45 minutes. So <laughs> it's a, it was a, a contract construction worker working on like, you know, building railways in the United States. And he had this terrible accident. And the bar of metal that you have here is actually a bar of metal that went through his skull. So when under his cheekbone, pop up his eye, Came out on the top and uh, damaged his brain. Uh, and he survived the accident. That's a fantastic, first fantastic part. The guy survived. Um, but his personality was radically changed. He became aggressive, irreverent, 
saying profanities, and uh, lack of planning this day, went outside in the north of the states. I don't know if you've been to the north of the states, but it's super cold in the winter. Because like the pajama pants and seen boots almost died from the cold. Um, so the radical change of company that was not discussed on before. Um, and that led uh, his doctor and later Antonio Damasio saying that that's because the personality of the VR and the control of high emotion is located in the region of the damage and dissipation, which is the medial part of the frontal lobe, which is the part of the brain that has been damaged by the entry of the bone. And we'll talk about the part of the brain that's been damaged. We exit. I really care about that, apparently. But that was the logic behind it, locating this function into this part of the brain. Personality, orbital frontal cortex, mouth and medial. Who knows this guy? Nobody. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's the point. It's the first patient of Brokaut, and the one that lost the ability to speak and damage uh, the posterior part of his entire frontal lobe. There was no MRI scan at that, camp, at that time. He came to see his doctor, broke out because he got a gangrene of the leg, got his leg amputated, died two weeks after. And the doctor was interested in, with his language impairment, so just extracted his brain and showed it to people and did a publication with it. But well, those were rough times. Okay. And I skip a lot of the stories that is pretty tough. Don't get sick in France at that time. Um, but anyway, that's why we call this area of the brain uh, the broke area, which is thought to be the critical center for the production of speech. That's why it happens. Um, and then you have arimolazin, like an epileptic patient, um, that um, in a way went uh, radical surgeries and removed bilaterally the medial part of his temporal lobe, touching his hippocampus, the entire part. When he wake up from this surgery, not able, being able to speak, not being able, uh, sorry, he woke up with surgery, being able to speak, being able to count, being able to work, real success in the surgery, except that he was not able to build any new episodic memories. No new recollection. The guy spent his life almost living the same day every day just because he could not remember what he did the day before. And that was a, he became like a professional patient uh, that allowed to dissociate all the memory from procedural to uh, uh, episodic memory to implicit memory. Um, it's a very famous case. And this is a case that brought us to think that memory is located in the hippocampus, even though the region expands to other brain areas in this patient. There's all three very famous cases usually in the book of neuropsychology and neurology as a demonstration that functional of life the brain. And so like for the anniversary of a famous person, Norman Geshwin, who work on connection and disconnection, uh, we saw how that we apply this method to those three cases and see if we could do an interpretation of the brain disconnection that is at least as good as the location of the beach. And this is possible now to do systematically uh, thanks to the software that Chris rules in the back developed that you can download and apply to your, to your own. So if you do that, um, you're able to extract a pattern of disconnection that is specific to the single patients. If you take Phineas Gage, the lesion, the passage of the bar through his skull actually disconnected the ancinate fasciculus as well as many other frontal frontal associated connections. Um, what's interesting with the ancinate fasciculus if you take a cat, who has a cat at home? Right, right, you have a cat? All right, okay. just two persons on the cat. All right, you take the cat, and you cut the ancinate fasciculus, it's gonna become a bad cat. It's gonna be very aggressive. And that's a demonstration, don't do it. It's just like, uh, 
the naive but like it's just a demonstration that when you when you cut your antenate fasciculars, um, you have the emergence of aggressive behavior, at least in cat, and you can somehow extend it to human because there are like a lot of similarity in the structures. Then the damage in the frontal frontal connection damage when we go in uh, cognitive neuroscience of branching models that have different regions inside the frontal lobe that are uh, activated in a serial way according to the complexity of the task so you can plan your action and you can you can organize your behavior and this will explain why in the case of Phineas Gage a passage of the star interrupted the connections and led uh, him to go outside and send it to the university. Okay. So at the middle of the 19th century, there is no neuropsychological assessment. There is no neuropsychologist, as a matter of fact. All we have is a description of what actually the victim did. If you look at uh, Louis Victor Le Boyne, and that's been described by Nina Lutas in uh, 2007, the lesion in the case of Le Boyne, where going well beyond what you could see on the surface, which was I was saying in the introduction, sometimes things are going far further than what you can see in the surface. Um, damage of white matter in the pre uh, uh white matter, which if you see a silvan, silvan fissure, lateral fissure, and you get like all this white matter in the that it was damaged by the lesion, interrupting the arcuate fasciculus and all neighboring tracts, explaining that why Le Bon was not able to speak. In the case of Henry Molaison, so it's a bilateral lesion, this bilateral lesion interrupted the circuitry of the PAPE circuit, like all the connection of the PAPE circuit. We could have a disconnection of the cingulum fasciculus, the phonics, and the ancillary fasciculus again. Um, and those three try have been reported to be related to memory. Uh, so in the monkey, another behavior that we have when you cut the ancillary fasciculus is they're not able to elaborate memories um, uh, related to emotions. You know there is this trick, if you want to learn something, you try to associate it with a strong emotion, or you remember very well stuff that is associated with strong emotion. But if you're not able to do that, you remember things much less. Um, so phonics is also an interesting one because um, sometimes human patients have a cyst in the third colitis, like a little cyst over here, and neurosurgeon remove it. Neurosurgeon are not all as good as the others. Sometimes they cut the phonics accidentally because why is it? And the patient come out with memory, episodic memory deficits, or like the inability to produce new episodic memories. And then you have the cingulum. The cingulum is interesting. It's a core structure that is damaged and has a disease. It projects in the medial part of uh, the uh, brain, particularly an area which is retrospinal cortex under the precuneus, which is very important that the areas that have most of the hypometabolism, most of the amyloid plaque, most of the reduction of the cortical sickness, and has a disease which is characterized by the loss of episodic memory. So, those three cases classically described for the location of the lesion, revisited in terms of disconnection. Just want to say that our interpretation of the symptom based on the disconnection is at least as good as the one as the localization of the lesion. So, I don't see why people should ignore brain disconnections. And so we recently, we did several different uh, neuropsychological explorations, uh, but we recently released the first map of the entire brain with a projection of the tests that are typically impaired when that track is disconnected. Uh, I won't show you all the slides, just one slide, but uh, you can see here, uh, and you cannot put the entire name of the test inside the brain, of course. We put like the short version of the name. But you can see that uh, different, and this is also the top of the iceberg. This is a test that is a mostly damaged by disconnection of the track. 
you can see that you have a distribution of the data that is different. And then you can statistically connect a pathway with a deficit without really being so interested about the surface description of the localization of the mission. Um, so this atlas is available uh, to download or online. You know, if you create this connection map, sorry, the resolution is not great, but um, uh, you can project it into this embedded space that we have and uh, predict for any patient that you have their outcome uh, one year after the lesion. That was the work of uh, Lia in our lab. Um, the resolution is not great. Sorry about that. But um, the idea is uh, you just load on the website a disconnection map that you calculated with the tool, this V2 that I just mentioned. You press run. And um, 10 seconds later, also, uh, the software gives you the prediction of the outcome of this patient one year after its lesion. So you can verify if you want with your patient if you still see him one year after. And this has been validated uh, in the same sample, patients that we put aside, in a different sample in Iowa, in a different sample in Lille, France, in a different sample in Grenoble, and it's been just validated two months ago in Cathy Price data set in London for language prediction. The one-year prediction is as an R square of 0 0.2, which has never been done before. So it works. Just looking at these connections help you predict the outcome of patients. But just looking at connections actually helps you also uh, predict the pattern of activation in healthy people as well. So the way things are connected in the brain of individual can allow you to predict the way it is activated in the individual. Um, and so this is something that we uh, try to do as well uh, by looking at profile of, of uh, connection and disconnection. Um, we decode the pattern of activation in the brain and reproject the, the term of activation in the brain onto the white matter as a white matter support for the pattern of activation is a cortex. You can create the same kind of map that I showed to you before, but then instead of projecting the neuropsychological symptoms, you project directly the term that is related to the task relate task activation map with functional MRI. And you create those map of functions onto the right map. And and that was done like based on meta analysis and we saw that like, uh, it would be nice if we could go beyond and allow people to use a single fmri data set and revisit it the way we did lesion analysis with a disconnectome but take your fmri data set and revisit we change your fmri data set by projecting the whole signal into the white matter and recalculate your analysis looking at the brain in a connected way. And this is a, a third software that we developed, which is called the function atom, and that's exactly uh, what we did. Um, so you take the variation of the activation in the brain, whether this is at rest or during a task. Um, this is the ball signal, it's not even an activation, so it's a ball signal, and then you project it onto the white matter according to the probability of connections that you derive from an healthy group. It's very much like the disconnector, except that you project continuous value onto the white matter. This is the entire brain. Okay. And the way it works is you, you don't run it at the end when you have your activation looking at what is connected to your activation. You insert it right before your statistical analysis to statistically assess the involvement of white matter rather than just showing the white matter that's connecting the blocks. Okay. In so doing, you assess not the local activation, but the integration 
of the functional signal onto the white matter and its contribution to the task you want to study. We can give a, a couple of examples that we published in the latest years. Um, so you have here finger tapping. You do your finger tapping, classical analysis. You're going to have activation of blobs in your cortex, mostly centered on the hand over here. Okay, but also other areas. You take the same data set, put in the function actor, do the same statistical model exactly. You have another statistical map, and if you show it in three dimension, you have the continuous map of the map. And then you have the circuitry supporting your functional activation or the circuitry from which they match your functional character. Okay. See your faces, and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Those people need coffee. <laughs> so that is this part. And then um, then we expanded it like recently. You can also dissociate association commercial and projection tracks, which in the future allow us to define whether a uh, function is more related to the Interhemispheric interaction of the association between different brain regions or the projections, and also see clearly the circuitry because when you have everything mixed together, but there sometimes it's hard to decide which track is involved. Okay. This work for task related activation, but I know like uh, many of you are interested in uh, resting state functional connectivity. It works also for resting state functional connectivity. You project your rest variation of the whole signal, run your ICA, PCA, whatever you want to do. And then you start extracting networks that are just not only the product, but also the white matter. And you can divide the resting state network, not only based on the surface activation or co-activation, but also the subcortical uh, connectivity. Another recent example that we've been doing is like, um, we applied that to a hot topic because we'd like to work on integration and emergence and people often associate that to uh, consciousness. Um, so we're like, uh, what would happen if we take like um, three different tasks that are measuring whether people saw something or didn't see something in the MRI scan? It's just a simple way of defining consciousness, which is reportability. I saw it. I didn't see it. It is a contrast between the two. If you do the contrast between the two, you have those activation in ITS, a bit of activation in guesses like you know, posterior angular gyrus or impaired part of the superior uh, occipital uh, gyrus. Then you have the intraparietal circles that have a very strong frontal field and middle frontal gyrus. Those are surfacing activation. But if you run the function actor on, onto this, you have a very strong circuitry that pops up that is made of connections that would make sense in the way you interpret people being able to report what they saw. Um, and particularly, uh, you have activation, co activation, you can call it the way you want, of the posterior segment of the arcuate fascicles that will connect. The visual ventral stream, which we know is not very conscious of what you saw, that just decode visual information. And so we'll connect it with the so frontal part of connection that will allow you to manipulate this visual information in your working memory or your global workspace or where you want to put it. Then we have a connection of the corpus callosum that will connect those. <coughs> information to the left hemisphere so you can verbalize it because you can be very much aware of what you saw but if you cannot verbalize it reputability is going to be zero no you're not going to say that you saw it if you're not able to verbalize that you saw it in your mind 
And then we have the entire thalamic radiation, and that's a uh, very big contribution of the thalamus that recently has been discussed uh, in light of not a condition relay that we read in every book, but rather um, uh, the structure that monitors the synchronization between brain regions, like the conductor really of the symphony in the brain. Telling you this is your turn, I'm going too fast, slow down. One more of this over here, um, and I very much love this metaphor. So we look at this, and we uh, we also assess what is the contribution of the functional term in terms of the level of uh, statistical significance compared to the classical approach in a fMRI. So here you have like the voxel activated. The uh, z value, and this is a bar plot. This is how many voxels are activated in the brain. If you um, if you do the classical fMRI analysis, then you have this uh, nice, almost like a B model uh, distribution of activation of voxels in the brain. Those are deactivation. Those are activation. That are related to the task of saying yes, I saw the target. No, I didn't see the target. If you do the same with a functional tool, you have this very strange profile that where actually you have much less voxels that are deactivated and much more voxels that are activated. And for this part, very interesting. It looks like by changing the model of how you approach the brain, harvesting information of how it is connected, projecting information onto how it's connected because you're interested not in the local activation, but as what is happening when you put all together behind the theory that the world is more than the sum of the part, you obtain more when you look at it in the white matter. And when you look at it locally. But when you look at deactivation, I look like functional atom is not working at all. It's like deactivation are not loading onto the white matter, at least for this task of yes, I expect oh, I can see it. So I mean like deactivation in this context is not following the white matter structure. It's just deactivation happening passively. And this is not following the white matter structure and believing in the importance of white matter into the function of the brain and you can see patients and everything. Then the activation just a you know the passive effect of the activation that is not related really to the function. That's an interpretation. So turn to discussion for the next three days. And so this is a an updated model that we uh, try to very much reflect the model of attention of my but attention, working memory, and awareness, very much overlapping function in the brain. Uh, where we uh, describe a lot of it, so you have this visual input, and then you have to take the posterior segment of the iPad fasciculus to go onto your global workspace or your attention network or your working memory network in order to manipulate this information by manipulating it. You become aware and conscious of its representation of what it is. You got to connect with the other hemisphere, for example, in this direction, in order to verbalize it, being like, yes, I saw it. If you don't verbalize it, we see that in split brain patients, like some weird stuff happening in terms of what you're conscious of and what you're not conscious of. And uh, the time that is the conductor behind it being really managing synchronization between this entire symphony of people uh, work to, working together perfectly at you. So what I, I, I try to do in this presentation is try, really trying to give you like a different perspective beyond just diffusion imaging. What does it mean to study diffusion imaging and string connections? It's not only a method, it's a shift in the way you look at how the brain works. Because every time you open your laptop and you use a statistical method, you belong to a centuries old school of thought about how the brain works. I'll give you an example. Localizationism, 
you open your laptop, like I'm going to do some voxel, le voxel lesion symptom mapping, that's a addition of lesion. I'm going to do some voxel based multimetry. I'm going to look at cortical sickness in different brain regions. I'm going to do dice related fMRI, PET EEG, MEG every time you look at local change. You become member of the localization in school. The representation of the brain is a modular organization with different brain regions dedicated to different things. If you knock one out, this is the function that's going to be damaged in that case with no impact onto other regions. If you start doing other techniques, such as the trackways analysis, functional connectivity, effective connectivity, or anatomical connectivity, you connect things together, you try to look at the integration of information or the exchange of information between brain regions. And this exchange of information between brain regions is a key behind symptom, is a key behind function as we know it. Your representation of the brain is made of networks. And any damage to an area will have an impact onto this network, whether this is positive or negative symptoms. And so we tried to uh, recently push this a little further with uh, uh, Stephanie. This game is the same idea with the example of language. The localizationism will tell you you have a lesion in the broca area, release the ability to produce speech. You have a lesion of the Wernicke area, you lose the ability to understand. I don't want to spoil it, but you lose <laughs> your lesion of the pilot lobe. You have uh, uh, an impairment in the ability to elaborate concepts in your language. And that would be the localizationist school. You can fragment those big region and sub region if you want for sub mechanism. But you also have people that started connecting things, uh, like our former uh, postdoc and um, PhD supervisor, Mark Petney, who's very associationist. He likes to make trajectories in the brain of processing root from those different regions. And every root is connecting A to B to C, having a local process and telling you a story of what's going to happen at the end of the root that the associationist way. But it is very penalizing in terms of time. You cannot take all those roots and have a reaction time of 300 to 700 milliseconds. That is a very long way to process. So we thought like maybe the brain is working in an integrative way. When the function emerge from the interaction with brain regions, and then with that, instead of having the root of successive events, it's a pattern of coactivation that is supported <laughs> by the structural connectivity behind that will produce the color of the behavior that you observe. Okay. If you think about it, and you brought it like to a different perspective. We don't know how you know amino acids work together. To produce life. And then in the body, we don't know how, why all the cells stay together to produce the body alive that we have. Because the idea would be the same way for the brain, where we're trying to understand how the brain neural cells work together to have these other imaging properties, which is the behavior of the thought and the cognition that we have. Because the idea is like the function is not located in area A, area X, Y, or Z, but through the integration of this exchange, you have an imaging property, which is a function. And the advantage with that is that um, you have way more possibilities with your system. Uh, those are uh, those are work that we did in the PhD of Chris <coughs> in the back. So that you take the localizationist approach, you just look at the computational possibilities that you have with three brain regions, you only have three options, either A, B, or C, X, Y, or Z that is activated. 
if you look at uh, the hierarchical organization, due to the fact that not everything is connected together, you have even less possibilities in these three regions. And if you take the emerging properties with the integration with pattern, then you have exponential number of possibilities and representation that will match the complexity of the human condition, cognition as we know it. And this increases drastically as you increase the number of regions in the brain. Good. And that's about it. I'll take your questions. I told you. So just the first two hours, we have three days like this. Get ready. Take some vitamins. Yes. I, I had a question about the experiment you did. Uh, yeah. So that's the tip. What are you doing on like subliminal visual? Like, or was it like seeing? Yeah, it's in staircase. You don't um, even have the connection of the visual and not any of Right. Yeah. So what are you doing? I think I did for I didn't see the person like what you're calling the connection when there is a general report. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they have report or normal right. or unconscious processing. Right, 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 right. I tried to do something like that years ago, but it was very hard to make it very clear from my scan. So it's yeah. just seen or unseen. Okay. And it's a model report if I remember well. Right. That's a button. Okay. We still have to cross the hemisphere to the press on the right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. I have a curiosity. You mentioned the deterministic and probabilistic right. Yeah. So is the deterministic the way to go? I know there is yeah. a lot of debate. No, no, no. It, uh, it's so there is um there is no way to go. So bad deterministic or bad probabilistic are as bad as each other. Um it's just you need to be conscious of the limitation and the advantages. Probabilistic is advantageous if you want continuous matrices. It will give you those nice Gaussian distributions and statistically it is advantageous. But you won't extract a specific accurate measure from probabilistic tractography, which is your trust going to be so loose and big and you have to put a lot of constraints. Then you got to use deterministic tractography. I'll say well, that's my approach, and I don't know, know everything about diffusion and tractography. But I would say if you want to look at the connective property of the cortex in a very computational way, probabilistic is a good approach. If you want to look at neuroanatomy and white matter connections, deterministic is a good approach. And then our deterministic has been finely tuned to the postmodern dissection we see. So we take it cautiously, but some other people want to believe in the power of diffusion imaging and how much you can take from it and blindly without, you know, putting in limitation and take it for granted. Those are different school of thoughts, really. Um, I have mine and then, you know, I'm happy to discuss the others. Yes, I good. You need some ah, yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah, this is somewhat, and I wonder if the detection of from analysis is uh, like another way to see that instead of um, yeah. the value of the technology. So you start oh, yeah. from the camera in these like modes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like the functional term is to fMRI, where the disconnect term is to lesion. Uh, um, I'm ready. Okay, so instead of looking at the localization of the lesion, instead of looking at the localization of the variation of the whole signal, mm -hmm. you look at how it goes onto the white matter. This is what you statistically test. Mm -hmm. That allow you to, uh, when you do that, it's not only another method, it's another approach onto the function of the brain, which is like it's going to be relevant to my function when both projections on that given track are changing and um, selling up onto the track. And it seems like um, it seems like so far that it worked with better results than when we when we use classical activation approach. And so it, it basically um visualize like like you create some algorithm to infer 
Uh, yeah. Based on uh, the time series of the posture. Yeah, so exactly, exactly like the disconnector, we have priors in the background uh, that define on high resolution cryptography or high resolution is connected together. Mm -hmm. And then it's a weighted sum of the activation and the white matter. So if you have a, a strong connection between those two areas that are highly active, highly co-variating during the task, mm -hmm. you're going to have a high variation onto the white matter that connects those two areas. If uh, one area is changing its behavior with the task, but not another that it is connected to, the connection is not going to come out as soon. It's, we have a video that explains it all. Mm -hmm. it's, well, extensively. And a nice elevator in the background. Mm -hmm. Console free on our website and the mm -hmm. start it and try it. I would say it's always interesting to look at things from a different angle. Uh, when we developed the disconnect on people like you can't do that, it's forbidden. How do you believe that you could look at the connection? How much try it? It's very you try it on your lesion, see whether something comes out significant better than your lesion overlapping. And if ten months, you know, people are happy about it. And now we do the same thing with functional MRI. I don't know. This is uh, exciting. I like white matter, I like connection. I'd like to see it activated. This is a way to do it. Just try it. See if it works. Can it help you to interpret what's happening in the brain? Can we see in 10 years? Any other questions? Then good. Need some coffee? Yes. Yeah. So, great. So, the coffee is downstairs. Um, and we have, if I come back to the program, uh, we have a little bit of time. We'll, uh, we'll meet at 11.30 back to do the project pitch. Um, so, you can, uh, you can hear about what's going to happen in the afternoons. Right. And then we have lunch, and you can try to. What I do recommend during lunch is you approach the people whose project pitch was interesting to you, and uh, you just have lunch with them, and you you start like discussing and working the project. As well. Sounds good. Thank you very much. See you in uh, forty minutes.